Thanks, Dave. It's a real honor to be here today. And uh, you know, looking at the program, I, I really uh, I wish I could stay for the whole day. I, I uh, you know, Kevin. I've heard Kevin's talks multiple times over the years in different versions. And you know, Kevin Wilk, I think, is one of the the main reasons that D Jim Andrews has the name that he has. And so, you know, we really value what physical therapists and athletic trainers do. Uh, I think it's probably more important than our surgery in a lot of cases. So I'm really pleased to be here today and appreciate Ben and, and Steve inviting me. Uh, in terms of disclosures, the only thing that's really relevant to this talk is that uh, some of the information on the UCL repair uh, does relate to Arthrex and I do have a royalty uh, stream and consultant uh, for Arthrex. I said I have to, to leave a little bit earlier today. This is my son, my oldest son on the right. He's 16 now. Um, I'm not sure who the guy on the left is exactly. But uh, the guy on the left I'll be with on Saturday, uh, tomorrow, for the uh, little soiree in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, if you haven't been to LSU for a night football game, it's an experience. You really ought to try to go someday. It, it's worth the trip. Uh, probably one of the most fun environments you'll ever be in, in any sporting event. You know, it was interesting when I saw the brochure. <laughs> I looked up there, I said, holy crap, I've got that same picture. <laughs> Look at that. So, really an honor to be here with, with Steve and, and, of course, with his dad and, you know, Jim Andrews and, and his dad were big buddies. Um, I told Steve about this picture last night. This is an Alabama game, obviously, and Joe Namath was our, was our honorary captain a couple of years ago. He's a little bit older than he was in the, in the picture on the upper left, but uh, Joe was standing there and I was standing there with my credentials on and I had never met Joe. Uh, but I was standing there just, just pre-game talking to the doctors for the other team and Joe looks over at my name badge and it says Dr. Lyle Kane, head team orthopedist. And he goes, Dr. Lyle, Dr. Kane, what do you do? I said, I'm a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon. He goes, oh my God! He gives me this big hug and he just latches on like we're best friends. He goes, Steve Nicholas. Dr. Nicholas, is, he's, my, he's my best friend. He's my savior. He saved my life. If it wasn't for Dr. Nicholas, I wouldn't be walking today. I wouldn't be where I am today. He goes, I love you guys. I love you guys. So I had instant credibility with Joe Namath based on Dr. Nicholas. So I, I really appreciate that. Wow, what a series. Wasn't that crazy? Unbelievable, Unbelievable series. You know, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a baseball fan, but I really, you know, in Birmingham, we don't have a team. We don't have a baseball team. So... Most of us that grew up in the Southeast grew up as Braves fans, Atlanta Braves fans. Uh, and it was great to have the Braves win the World Series, whenever that was, 25 years ago, a long time ago. Uh, but I think all of us kind of internally are Cubs fans because we felt so bad that the Cubs had this long streak. And, you know, I guess now we'll have to be Indian fans after all that. Chris and Jay, to pitch is to no pain and for some Tommy John surgery. But there's an astonishing increase in operations on teenage arms. We will take you inside the operating room next, outside the lines. I hard to believe this is 2004. August 22nd, 2004. <laughs> Many of the most dominant and successful pitchers in Major League Baseball have had their career saved by Tommy John surgery. It's kind of a weird process, but it seems to work. <laughs> but increasingly, Youngsters eager to pitch their way to the big leagues find themselves on the same operating table. We've seen a tenfold increase in high school baseball injuries, major baseball injuries requiring surgery in the last five years. But many young pitchers are willing to pay that price. A lot of kids just kind of think, you know, well, it doesn't matter what I do, because if I throw my, if I throw my arm, I'll just get Tom John. Now everybody comes back better than before and, and everything else. You know, once you go in there one time and have surgery, the arm's not the same. Today outside the lines, the disturbing injury explosion among young pitchers. So, you know, it's amazing how time flies. I, I would swear if you showed me that video, it was about five years ago, but it was actually 12 years ago. Uh, and, and that was the time when, you know, I just finished fellowship in 2000, so I'd been here about uh, four years at the time. And we started looking at the data. I was, I was gathering all the data from UCL's database that Dr. Andrews had done, and I was putting together this database, and I noticed that there was this trend that was occurring where we were starting to see younger and younger patients at higher numbers having UCL surgery, having Tommy John surgery. And, and it really, the trend has continued. Unfortunately, it's 12 years later. Uh, there's been a lot of media attention, uh, but the trend is still there. We're still seeing many, many high school age and younger athletes uh, that are having UCL, and there certainly is an epidemic. Uh, you look at the Major League Baseball uh, press, you know, if you Google Tommy John Major Leagues, you know, it'll fill up your computer with, with articles. There's a lot of data, a lot of information out there 
Um, even, even recently, um, this is October, looking at the guys that came back from Tommy John surgery. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the wording below, it says, last year alone, there are 112 players from all levels of professional baseball have Tommy John surgery. So pretty impressive numbers. Um, Stan Conti, with the uh, longtime athletic trainer for the Los Angeles Dodgers, has done a lot of the research on this. And if you look at the number of Tommy Johns in Major League Baseball alone, uh, certainly an increase in numbers. I think you can attribute a lot of this to going back to the youth leagues 10, 12 years ago. So why is it that Major League has this problem? It's not because Major League Baseball has changed as much as the Youth League Baseball changed 20 years ago, and you've seen this increase in numbers. So pretty astounding if you look at the overall number of Tommy Johns in the last, this, this goes back to 1974. The, the costs are significant, and that's why the Major League Baseball is involved. Uh, the average financial cost for medical care in the Major League Baseball is about $420, $420 million a year. Uh, that ranges pretty widely over those years. Uh, total cost over the last 18 years is $7.6 billion in Major League Baseball. The last three seasons alone have been $2 billion. And if you look at the increase in salary, which is, you know, to most of us is pretty astounding how much a Major League Baseball player makes. You know, the guys in the World Series this year, some of them made league minimum and some of them made $22 million a year. Um, those have risen since 1998 by 300%, but the cost of taking care of injured players is even more. It's 400% increase over that same time period. When you look at the prevalence in, in Major League Baseball, one in four Major League Baseball players is post Tommy John surgery, which is pretty dramatic. You know, when you think about 1970s, uh, UCL injury was probably uniformly career ending. Uh, now one in four guys have had UCL by the time they make it to major leagues. One in seven minor league pitchers, and if you look at for all players to get put together, 16% of, of pitchers have had it. <coughs> What about revisions? You know, this is the big issue in Major League Baseball right now is, is that if you look at the revisions, they were pretty rare. In the early 2000s, uh, three over a three-year period, uh, five the next three-year period. The last three-year period, 2012 to 14, there were 19 revision UCLs in Major League Baseball alone, which is, again, very concerning to those that uh, pay for that and to the to general managers that are hiring these players and signing these players and also to the physicians taking care of them. You know, what do you do? What do you tell a major league guy now if you have to do his UCL? Do you tell him that, you know, it's universally successful, everybody gets back, everybody's good? Or do you tell him that there's a pretty high rate he can re-tear it and he may be back on the, on the operating room table? Interestingly in this group, the, the average time from surgery to revision was five years. So it does last for a while. The range was variable. Um, but it's interesting that about 40% occur within the first three years of surgery. So uh, this all speaks to the rehab and recovery. And you know, in my mind, it's like the ACL recovery story. You know, are we coming back too soon? Are we pushing these players back too soon? Is it just because they look good, they don't have swelling, that we let them go back to throwing? Or is there some biologic factor that we're not considering? So what we're talking about right, right now is the, is the UCL, which is the anterior bundle primarily that's shaded in yellow there. The anterior bundle is a main stabilizer in, in the throwing motion. So when you're 90 degrees of flexion, uh, shoulder abduction, that's what stabilizes your elbow. That's what, you know, that's the important part in baseball. Reconstruction can be performed in several different manners. It's usually using a free aut autologous graft. There are a few people using allograft, but it's pretty rare in baseball that we use allograft. Um, we do different bone tunnel configurations. The, the picture at the top right is the standard Job technique, which we do in Birmingham. Uh, the middle picture is the docking technique popularized by the Curlin Job group, and then the lower uh, picture is the interference screw technique that's been promoted, but I don't, I don't think is used very often. When you look at the, the background of Tommy John surgery, uh, performed initially on Tommy John, as most of you know, uh, by uh, Dr. Frank Job, uh, 1974. Uh, Dr. Job, I, I've actually heard before he passed away, I heard him give this talk several times, and you know, it was really interesting, his perception. Uh, in that when he did this surgery on Tommy John, it was really a, a last resort. Uh, back in those days, there were one-year contracts, so if you didn't play, you didn't get paid. Uh, Tommy John had an extremely unstable elbow. It was not one of these mild, valgus, unstable elbows. It was a, an extremely unstable elbow, and he got together with one of his partners as a hand surgeon, and they basically kind of made up the surgery to reconstruct the ligament. Well, afterwards, Tommy John had a claw hand. He had ulnar nerve uh, motor and sensory loss, developed a claw hand. It took three subsequent neurolysis procedures to get his nerve black where his, where his hand would function. And I think and Dr. Job felt like it was a disaster in general. So he was not going to do any more Tommy John surgeries, any more UCLs. 
Well, then here Tommy John comes back and pitches and, you know, ends up uh, doing well and, and having more victories after surgery than before. And I think he, he kind of, you know, because of his success, this surgery is, is popular. If Tommy John had never returned, despite all these complications, nobody would be doing this surgery today. There would probably be some other technique because it would have been considered a disaster. So modern techniques, we use kind of the Conway scale to determine what its success is. Success for us typically is returning to the same or higher level return to play. So if you're a AAA player, you get back to AAA or higher. If you're a college kid, you get back to college or higher. And that's been our success. And the average return to play on most studies is about 12 months for an evaluation. Uh, this is the study that Dr. Job uh, presented first in JBJS. Um, the technique is different than what we use today in a lot of ways. Uh, the success was based on the Conway scale of return to play, and they had about a 63% return to the same level, which, you know, compared to 0% prior to this, was, it was a huge improvement. Current techniques, uh, most of the studies out there have pretty short follow-up, about three years is, is the average, and the success is certainly better. All of the studies in the literature today, post the original Job article, have anywhere from 78 to 93% return to the same level. So overall, very good results. So the question is, why are we seeing so many of these injuries? And I think it gets back to youth pitching. We've done several studies and published several studies looking at risk factors in youth baseball. I think pitching when fatigued is the number one risk factor. Now, whether that's an overuse scenario or too many pitches in one game or too many pitches in a season, there's a lot of debate about how much the arm can handle, and it's probably individual. You know, there, there's probably the Nolan Ryan, Roger Clemens body and, and physique and mechanics that can throw 300 pitches a weekend and not get hurt. And then there's the other side, you know, that, that maybe can throw 50 pitches and that's their limit. So I think it's somewhat individual, but we do have pretty good data now that shows that once you meet certain thresholds, your risk goes up. Um, not enough rest, too, too much throwing year round, pitching consecutive days, poor mechanics, multiple teams, multiple leagues, uh, throwing curveballs or sliders early is a little controversial, but the general idea is that if you throw a good curveball or slider when you're a young, young baseball player, you're probably getting people out because nobody can hit a curveball. So you're more popular, you're more effective, you probably win more games and you pitch more. So the curveball and slider itself may not be a problem, but those pitchers usually throw too much. Um, and then too much throwing with not enough rest is kind of the end of the day philosophy. Um, when you look at these competitive throwers, especially in the South, and it may be the same way now in the Northeast, but in the South, baseball is a year-round sport. There's no question. You can play baseball every day of the year except for maybe a few rainy days in January, and, and you can get out and play. And so when you look at these competitive teams, these travel teams, my sons are 16 and 13, and I didn't let them play travel baseball. They weren't really that into baseball. They still play, but they weren't into it. But their friends were playing 70 games a summer, playing another 20, 30 games in the fall. They were playing 20, 30 games in the spring. The only time they had off was from Christmas to New Year's, one week a year was the time off. And so I think this overuse is, is consistent. Now, when you get to elite baseball, it's a little different. The biggest risk factor by far for an elite baseball player having a UCL injury is 100% is effort pitching. So the high velocity guys are, are, are important, uh, but the guys that are just those fireballers are the ones that are most likely to get hurt. You know, you don't see Greg Maddox type players get Tommy John injuries very often. The guys that spot pitches, control their speed, change speed, those guys don't get this very often. It's usually the hard, the hard throwers and guys that pitch with fatigue. So what are we talking about here? When you look at the original Job technique, his, his article is on 16 athletes, five were major leaguers, and, and his technique was different in that he detached the entire flexor muscle mass. And this goes back to the partner he worked with who was a hand surgeon, you know, who was used to doing submuscular sub ulnar nerve transposition. So he, you know, opened up the elbow, detached the entire flexor muscle mass, folded it down, did the reconstruction, which was probably easy to visualize with the, with the flexor muscles gone, and then put the nerve underneath the muscles and did submuscular transposition. Dr. Andrews kind of modified that technique and what we call the modified Job technique, and essentially is the same procedure, same drill holes, but we don't detach the flexor muscle mass. We just lift it off the ligament posteriorly, off the sublime tubercle and off the flexor uh, digitorum profundus. Uh, the Curling Job guys, uh, Frank Job and Lou Yoakum, came up with this muscle splitting technique. Uh, had very good results, 93% good to excellent in two years. A little bit less morbidity. They don't always transpose the nerve, uh, different from our technique. Uh, Dave Alchek and, and the guys over at Special Surgery uh, 
did this docking technique. Uh, they had a very good results as well. I think this has become a very standard technique for a lot of surgeons now in terms of how they fix their UCLs. Uh, Neil Elitrosh and, and uh, Chris Ahmad, uh, Curlin Job, Chris is obviously here in New York, uh, did the interference screw technique. I don't think many people use this as their primary technique now, but this is another uh, decent way to, to fix these grafts with less bone tunnels. And then there's a hybrid technique that uh, Josh Dines called the Dane technique for Dave Alchek and Neil Elitrosh. Um, not an easy thing to say, but uh, good results as well. And so I think the bottom line is any any of these mouse traps work. You know, there's there are different ways to fix the ligament as long as you have tissue there and you have a good uh, structural ligament. I think people generally do well. Now this is a paper that I published uh, in 2010. Uh, this was Jim Andrews' database. I uh, started collecting it when I was a fellow in 1999. Uh, it took me about 10 years uh, to get it uh, finished and published. Trying to find baseball players is a difficult endeavor. Uh, we've tried every technique known to man, including calling their parents, looking up the social security numbers, you know, trying to go through tax records, uh, Google, of course. Um, you know, you, you get a lot of dead ends. And, and the, the thing that worked best for me, if you guys heard Jim, Jim Andrews on that video, uh, when I was a fellow, I would call the players, I'd say, hey, big man, this, hey, this is Dr. Andrews, give me a call back. And that was the only thing that worked. If I said, I'm Dr. Kane calling for Dr. Andrews, or I'm with Dr. Andrews' office in Birmingham, nobody answered. But if I said, hey, big man, it's Jim Andrews, give me a call back, they, they always called back. So, so I tried to, tried to pass that along to my fellows when they do research talks. It's a good way to find players. So this is uh, me when I was a fellow in 1999. Haven't changed a bit. <laughs> uh, and that's Jeff Dugas on the left. Uh, we were fellows the same year, and, and we both worked on these, these papers together. So in our technique, just to kind of take you through it quickly, uh, the first thing we do, this is a right elbow. We'll do an incision kind of based over the medial condyle. Um, we're going to incise the skin right through the, uh, uh, kind of with, with the point of the incision being at the epicondyle. Uh, usually you need about two-thirds of the incision distal and about a third of the incision proximal. The first thing we do is we're going to find the medial anabrachial cutaneous nerve, uh, which runs kind of variably across the medial forearm. That's the branch right there, the little white structure that we're pulling out with the adsense. If you, if you don't find this nerve or somehow it gets damaged, it's not the end of the world. Typically what happens is the person has a little numbness behind their olecranon. So if you have patients that are numb behind their scar, it's probably a little bit of a stretch or damage to the medial anabrachial cutaneous nerve. Uh, we try to protect it just to prevent that from happening. The next thing we're going to do is we isolate the ulnar nerve. Um, you know, it's one of those things that when our fellows first get to Birmingham, many of them haven't seen many Tommy John surgeries. Um, they're extremely nervous about dissecting out this nerve. For whatever reason, I'm not sure what the, what the, the physiology is, the ulnar nerve is, is very um, robust and very uh, resistant to, uh, to me poking at it. <laughs> so you see there, somebody, why would you grab a nerve and force it? How stupid is that? But anyway, you, you, the ulnar nerve you can move, you can grab, you, and most of the time it, it does well. It doesn't go out. It doesn't, it doesn't give numbness or any kind of motor problems. Whereas other nerves, like the radial nerve, for instance, if you even look at it wrong, it goes out for six months. <laughs> so, so it's nice that the ulnar nerve doesn't do that. So we isolate the nerve. We get it completely mobilized. Uh, the technique that we do, this modified Job technique, it's important to move the nerve out of the way to drill the tunnels. And so because of that, we still transpose the nerve in every case. And that's controversial. A lot of people don't. A lot of people do leave the nerve in place, do a muscle splitting technique. But we're comfortable and we have a lot of data to back it up that this works well. So then we elevate the flexor muscle mass. Uh, this, is, this is using a scalpel just to elevate the flexor uh, dig digitorum profundus off the UCL. Uh, we start kind of right at the sublime tubercle, which is a little bump on the ulna. If you feel just distal to your epicondyle, you can feel your sublime tubercle. It's a little bony knob there that unless you do this a lot, you wouldn't even realize it was there. But it's a good landmark for the distal attachment of the UCL. You can see this person has a complete distal tear. Uh, the, the ligaments have vulsed off the sublime tubercle, and you're looking into the joint space, the medial joint space at this point. We then harvest a graft. About 80% of people have a nice palmaris longus. I have a champion palmaris longus. Well, you probably can't see it back there, but I've got a trophy palmaris. I tried to, I tried to donate it in 1999 to John Smoltz when I was a fellow because John Smoltz didn't have a Palmaris. He was already wealthy, he was already a big league pitcher. Um, I told him for a million dollars I'd donate, donate my own Palmaris, uh, but he didn't take it. So we ended up using another graft. But the Palmaris harvest is another one of those things that technically should be very simple, um, but it can be challenging at times. Two small incisions right at the wrist flexion crease, about two centimeters apart. 
Uh, the, the palmaris is typically immediately subcutaneous. If we have to dig more underneath the, the tissue or go deeper than the subcutaneous plane, I'm always worried that it's not the palmaris. Um, unfortunately, I've been an expert witness in four cases over the last several years of median nerve harvest, um, which is not good in a baseball player or anybody for that matter. Um, and I'm sure you guys have probably heard of cases over the years. It's a, it's a disaster. So, you know, if there's one part of the procedure that, uh, that makes me a little anxious, it's watching a fellow harvest a palmaris. Um, but if, you know, you get a good feel that this is, looks like tendon, uh, it doesn't look like nerve, it's attached, we'll typically make a third incision, proximal in the forearm, uh, find the, the, uh, the muscle attachment of the palmaris, and then we pull the tendon through the skin and pull it out through the, the proximal forearm. So we end up with a nice long palmaris graft. We then drill bone tunnels. Uh, this is the configuration of the tunnels we use for the modified Job technique. Again, if you use the docking techniques, it's a little different. You have a blind tunnel coming up the medial condyle. So for these uh, tunnels, we start off about a centimeter distal to the articular surface, uh, just posterior on the sublime tubercle of the ulna. Uh, we'll drill one tunnel, then we pass a, put a hemostat in, uh, and then we'll drill the second tunnel to make sure they meet at a, at a 90 degree angle. That way we have a, a good circular tunnel through this sublime tubercle of the ulna. We drill the same tunnels through the medial condyle, and then we pass the graft. So we pass the graft using these little curved, uh, what's called Houston suture passers uh, with uh, loop sutures, and we pass the, the graft through the sublime tubercle of the ulna and then up through the mid-up condyle. You can also see in this picture that the native ligament has been repaired. So part of our process is that before we pass our ligament graft, we repair the native ligament. So if it's torn off distally, we sew it back to the bone distally. If, it, if it's torn off proximally, we sew it back to the bone proximally, and then we pass the graft on top. So you end up with double collagen. You have native ligament on the bottom that's been repaired. You have collagen of a, of a graft, whether it's a Palmaris graft 80% or gracilis graft from a hamstring 20% of the time, you have extra collagen there. So we'll pass the graft through the tunnels. And the last thing we do is a subcutaneous ulnar nerve transposition. Uh, we do this again in all cases just because of the fact that we have to transpose the, uh, the nerve in order to, to see the ligament. So in terms of outcome, uh, when I did this study in 2010, we had 1,281 UCLs. Uh, the previous uh, high number in the literature was, was 78, so there's a few more cases. Uh, Jim Andrews had been doing these for several years and we just finally got the data together. We had follow up on 80%, they were more than two years out, which was 743 patients. Uh, primarily baseball players, 89% were pitchers, the average follow up was about four years. The important number for us in terms of, of success rate was return to play at the same or higher level and 83% return to that same or higher level. Um, when you look at the repair numbers, and we'll talk about repairs as a separate subset, uh, the repairs in the Andrews cohort, there were about 16 of them. They were done generally early in this process and they were purely repaired back to bone using drill holes. There were no suture anchors, there were no uh, modern technology tapes and all these other things and only 63% of the repairs returned and, and this is one of the studies that cited to, to justify why repairing the ligament doesn't work. But I'll show you some data later that it may work with, with current technology. Return to competition took about a year. Uh, and the interval throwing program, which is the beginning of the throwing process, even at very short intervals, started at about four and a half months. And this was really based on Kevin Wilkes' philosophy and his, his rehab protocol, not anything we did. Uh, Daryl Osbar won the, uh, won the awards at our AOSSM meeting in the last couple of years uh, looking at 10-year follow-up. So this is the only paper out that shows long-term follow-up of UCLs. Uh, we had 313 patients that were more than 10 years out from Tommy John. Average follow-up was 12, 12 and a half years. Uh, and again, the return rate was the same. But the important thing that we showed in this paper was that their career longevity was very good. So if you compare their career to a, a non-operated pitcher, somebody who's never had surgery, the career length of the Tommy John patient was actually just as good or longer than somebody that didn't have Tommy John surgery. And that's important for general managers and for players and for families when you're consulting these people, uh, is that the UCL will hold up for most of their career. Uh, most of these players retired for something other than the elbow, um, and 98% were still throwing after retirement. You know, if any of you guys know professional baseball players, once you're a professional baseball player, it's unlikely that your future career will not include something to do with baseball. <laughs> 
whether you're a pitching coach or an instructor, or you coach your son's team or throw a BP, you know, all these guys that are professional baseball players, they continue playing baseball long after their career's over. So I think that's important. Their primary reason for retirement was the shoulder. Uh, and this was interesting. We, we kind of, we, we knew this, we told players this over the years, but we didn't have the data. When you look back at 10 year data, most of these players retired from baseball, not for the elbow, but for the shoulder. And so there's obviously some connection there. Only 14% retired because of the elbow. Many of these had had shoulder surgery post Tommy John surgery. So what about the shoulder? Well, if you look at all the players, 34% um, had shoulder problems during their baseball career. These were just UCL patients. So there's, there's certainly an association between shoulder pathology and shoulder mechanical problems and, and UCL. And about 25% had shoulder surgery during their baseball career. What about quality of life? So this is John Smoltz. He's uh, currently trying to play enough golf to be eligible in the uh, senior PGA. Although I saw him doing, <clears throat> doing TV this week, so he may have changed his mind. He was actually one of the commentators for the, for the uh, World Series. Interesting. Uh, but most of them do very well. They have very little pain with activities. Uh, they're able to throw recreationally. And they were able to do everything they're satisfied with their UCL reconstruction. When you look at, at uh, biomechanics, Excuse me. Um, Glenn Fleissig and his group have looked at a lot of our players. We took 80 uh, players, 40 with UCLs and 40 normal, compared the mechanics and there were no uh, changes. So post UCL, the players' mechanics appear to be back to their normal mechanics, same as if they had no surgery. So again, looking at these revisions, this is the Major League Baseball data from Stan Conti, <coughs> 2010, 2000, 2014. The revision rate has certainly increased. Um, if you look at just the, um, excuse me, just the Major League Baseball players, the revision rate is about 14%. So if I tell you, you're a pro baseball player, we can fix your elbow, um, and there's a 3% chance you'll have surgery, that doesn't sound too bad. If I tell you there's a 14% chance that you're going to fail and that you're going to have to have a revision, then that doesn't sound quite as good. And that's, that's kind of what has everybody concerned right now. Thank you. So the question is, are we causing this by going too fast in rehab? And that's why we started looking at UCL repairs. So if you look at, at uh, the repair data, the Conway Job data, uh, repairs 50% return the same level compared to 68 reconstructions. But Buddy Savoy has a lot of recent data in 2006, looking at repairs 16 of 17 return the same level of sport. Interesting, his mean return time was under three months. So when you look at a Tommy John surgery, it was 12 months minimum. His repairs were coming back at three months. He recently published this study of 60 patients. Repair with suture anchors. Now these were average age of 17. So these are younger players. Uh, and 58 of 60 returned an average of six months. So, so Buddy's had good results with suture anchors. And this started thinking about this. There's very little historical evidence in the literature. The total literature of UCL repair is about 200 patients. Most of these techniques, even the Jim Andrews paper, did not have modern anchor technology. We didn't have any of these super sutures, and we didn't really have clinical experience with UCL surgery, and so the rehab techniques were different. So Jeff Dugas and, and some of the other guys we work with around the country started looking at this UCL repair with internal bracing. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of this? Have you all heard of this in the media yet? Show of hands, anybody heard of this UCL repair technology? So not, not real prevalent. It's interesting, the uh, Major League uh, press, I guess you would call it, the people that follow Major League Baseball have really latched onto this, this idea. And I'll show you why, but I think it's, it's a little bit premature uh, that we're even talking about this. So this is what a UCL repair with augmentation looks like at the end of the day. So this is the native UCL, the, the epicondyls to the upper left, sublime tubercles to the lower right, just below that probe. And the UCL repair is where the, the UCL is repaired just like I did with the graft. But instead of putting the graft on top of it and doing a reconstruction, we take these, this super tape, this collagen coated uh, labral tape, and we fix it on both ends with a little small anchor, just like Steve Lee showed in the hand, in the hand literature. Uh, and it's a good way to fix this tape. And the tape kind of acts as an internal brace or internal backstop for the ligament to heal. And, and the reason we started doing this is we saw a lot of these patients, these young athletes, one-time event, 
no previous elbow problems, they're 17 years old, they have one pop and they tear the ligament off distally. So you've got this acute tear with an otherwise normal ligament, you know, does this person really need a full reconstruction? Do they need a full graft? And we wondered, maybe we're doing too much in these young kids. We're drilling holes, there's potential complications, ulnar nerve problems, epicondyle fractures, stiffness, could we do something less? So Jeff and, and some other guys came up with this technique. Jeff Dugas has been one of the, the main pioneers in this, uh, using these 3.5 millimeter uh, corkscrew swivel lock peak anchors. Uh, there are two of them. They have a collagen coated fiber tape between it that's doubled over. And then we use a size zero Tycron kind of super suture on one end that's put in the end wherever the, the tear is. So if, if you have a distal tear, we put the, the suture and the tape in the distal end so we can repair the ligament back down to bone. So when you look at the, the technique um, that we, we repair the ligament, the second anchor is placed at the other end of the ligament, uh, and we do this after the, the base uh, native ligament's been repaired. We've looked at this biomechanically and it was published in AJSM uh, just this year, uh, and what we found was that the, the uh, repair with internal brace uh, was basically just as strong as the native ligament and was probably just as strong or stronger than a reconstruction because the, the reconstruction has a little bit of uh, gap formation whereas the native uh, ligament plus the tape did not have much gap formation. The tape's a little stiffer. This is a surgical technique. This is one of Jeff's cases, another right elbow. So same incision, um, same initial process. We find the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve, dissect out the ulnar nerve. You don't have to transpose the nerve in this particular case. So in about half the cases, we have not transposed the nerve if they don't have any pre-op nerve symptoms. Um, so this is the medial cutaneous nerve, again, grabbing with a pair of forceps, just to see if it'll squeal. So we're going to dissect all, out the ulnar nerve. Once the nerve has been exposed, um, then we can, we can elevate the flexor muscle mass in order to find the anterior band of the ulnar ligament. Uh, you can do this same procedure through a muscle split, but we just from a uh, surgical recognition experience standpoint have typically exposed the nerve in order to find the ligament. So this is the posterior aspect of the ligament. The ligament's been exposed by lifting off the FTP muscle uh, off the sublime tubercle. And then we'll split the ligament to evaluate the, the ligament itself and you'll see that this patient has a distal tear just like the previous reconstruction case that I showed. So a distal avulsion of the ligament. The end is not attached uh, to the sublime tubercle. It should attach right at the bony margin. So the UCL just looks like a thickening of capsule. It's not a real uh, stout ligament like an LCL or some of the knee ligaments. It's, it's actually a very thin uh, band of tissue. It looks like just a thickening of the anterior joint capsule. So we split the ligament in line. This allows us to see the joint surface and also see exactly where the pathology occurs. You can see some fluid in the joint. This is one we actually scoped before. We, we scope about 10% of these for concurrent problems. Uh, we drill the first anchor along the, the detached portion, which in this case is, is the distal attachment. You can see there's a zero suture coming out the, the lower left side, and this is the, the uh, collagen-coated labral tape uh, that's attached to the anchor. This bone's really hard, so you have to drill and tap it. Uh, we'll then take this free suture and use this to reattach the ligament back down to bone, similar to any other suture anchor. So we're using this just like we would a typical suture anchor for ligament repair, uh, but it also is incorporating this tape. So we repair the native ligament, uh, doing side-to-side -side sutures and reattaching it to bone. And then we'll lay this collagen-coated tape on top of the ligament, pull it up to the epicondyle and tension it. Now I think the key to this process, just from a surgeon's standpoint, is that you know, we don't want to over-constrain this. There's a lot of concern about stiffness and, and over-constraining the elbow. Um, the UCL is not really an isometric ligament. It has very, very central part of it is, is isometric, but the, the most of the ligament is has some change in length through range of motion. So we have to be pretty conservative about how tight we put this in. We just want this to be kind of a check rein. So this is the last line of defense before this ligament tears. The native ligament is the first line of defense. The, the labral tape is, is kind of the backstop or the second line of defense. So we drill the second uh, insertion point right at the medial condyle origin of the UCL. We're going to tap this. Again, it's pretty tight getting this in. These, the bone in this area is pretty hard cortical bone. 
And then trying to tension this is a little bit tricky. What we typically do is we'll, we'll measure uh, the depth that this is going to be inserted using the end of this little swivel lock anchor. And we'll try to estimate how far, how, how much extra tape we need to make it exactly the same tension as ligament. And a lot of times we'll have to retension this. We'll put it in, put a hemostat underneath it, and we'll have to retension it to make sure that it's not too tight. So this is the labral tape on top of the native ligament that's been repaired. We take them through a range of motion, make sure that it doesn't constrain them in flexion. Uh, if you make it too tight when they go into flexion, it'll be extremely tight. And make sure they have plenty of room for this to have a little bit of slack uh, as they go through range of motion. So the current study, this was the first patient that Jeff operated on with this technique. He's a high school pitcher, um, left-hander. Uh, this was six months post-op, throwing off the mound. Uh, the first patient was done in uh, August of 2013. We've done a total of 82 to date. Uh, the first 40 are at least one year out, so we followed those patients up. Average age is about 17. Again, these are younger, healthy ligaments at baseline. Primarily baseball, but there's a smattering of other uh, uh, sports, just like we see in the Tommy John population. Three javelin throwers, including one Olympic javelin thrower. Uh, 22 baseball players, including eight college. Uh, five pitchers. In general, these patients get back much quicker than a reconstruction. Uh, they generally have full range of motion by six to eight weeks, just like a reconstruction. We start plyometrics very early, usually around six weeks. We start a throwing program uh, after four weeks of plyometrics, which is around week 10 or 11, and the return to play average has been 21 weeks. So you compare 21 week return to play versus 12 to 18 months for a reconstruction, a you know, big difference, so just under six months. 39 out of 40 so far have returned to their pre-injury level of sports participation. Uh, the only one that didn't make it back was actually a rock climber. So uh, she says she can't climb, says her elbow is just too sore to climb. Uh, not a baseball or softball player, but uh, that's our one failure so far. Uh, four of the high school kids have gone on to pitch in college, um, and we haven't seen any difference in their curling job scores or you know, any of the different variables that we've been able to look at with this small case series. So limitations, we have a very limited number of patients, only one year follow-up. Um, only high school and college athletes, although George Paletta in St. Louis uh, did this procedure on the first major league guy this summer, uh, June of 16. Uh, he called us and said, hey, you know, here's the story. This guy's end of his career. He really didn't have time to rehab for a year. He's not going to have a job next year if he doesn't throw soon. You know, he's got to be ready for next February, not next June. What do you think? And we said, you know, it's reasonable. But we're not going to do it. Why don't you do it? <laughs> so he did it on one of his one of his St. Louis Cardinal kids, and um, you know, guys, guys, only four months out, so we don't know how he's going to do yet. But it'll be interesting to follow, and you know, I think uh, that'll those type of athletes will certainly make this more popular if they make it back. Um, we really don't have a control group. You know, we haven't compared this to a, a non-operative clientele because these baseball players, if you try to randomize them, they're, they're not really randomizable. You can't take a baseball player and say, we're going to randomize you to no surgery versus surgery. So most of these players at this point come in wanting to be fixed uh, when they have an injury. So just conclusions, uh, kind of my thoughts about repair versus reconstruction in 2016. You know, I think reconstruction with a, with a soft tissue autograph, so a palmaris or gracilis graft, certainly has very good published outcomes. Everybody's papers from 2000 on are greater than 80% success rates, which I think is pretty good in baseball pitchers at a high level. We also know the long-term results. So we have data on 300 plus players more than 10 years out that shows that their long-term function is good. They can play with their kids. They can throw baseball with their kids. They can work in baseball if they want to. So we know the long-term outcomes. The repair with augmentation uh, certainly has less morbidity. You don't really have to drill the same hole uh, diameter that you do with a, with a re reconstruction. There's certainly at this point been faster return, six months versus 12 to 18 months for reconstruction but we don't have any long-term results. And so, you know, I tell Jeff all the time, it, you know, I, I, I fear for the day that somebody calls me and says, hey, um, this repair causes cancer. You're like, that's terrible. Well, I've got 82 patients I gotta call now. Or the first one that breaks loose or tears it loose. I think, you know, the first failure, or the first couple of failures we have is gonna make us really nervous. We've been very conservative at this point because we have concerns about stress shielding of the ligament. You know, maybe having that tape doesn't allow the ligament to heal normally. Maybe it heals softer or not quite as robust. Um, we worry about the suture and tape failure. What, what if the stuff 
you know, like the old Gore-Tex ACL ligaments that were put in the 70s, what if this tape lasts for five years and then falls apart? That's an issue. Uh, we also worry about anchor pullout and, and the, the difficult revision. So if this patient tears this thing loose, you have these two blind holes going in the epicondyle and the ulna, how do you work around that to do a reconstruction if you go back in for a revision case? And that's been something we've thought about the entire time, and that's why we've been pretty conservative. So my current algorithm, you know, I always try non-surgical treatment first. And so no matter who the player is and what time of year, I always try to talk them off the ledge, talk them down to the fact that some of these will heal and do well, especially if you're a non-elite pitcher, um, and try to get them through with non-operative treatment. But if they come to surgery, if they have healthy tissue, or if they have a really short time for return, say a senior high school baseball player that's in the summer of the beginning of his senior year, and he's got to play in eight months or he'll never play again, that's a good indication for me to do a repair. Or if there's somebody that's trying to get a scholarship and they know that if they don't make it back in six or eight months, their baseball career is over, but if they make it back, they may have a chance to go play junior college baseball or play college baseball. I think those are the guys that we're really looking at. Um, doing a repair. That was our initial cohort, and that's really what we started out doing. Um, and so we'll do the internal brace augmentation. If they have a chronic, chronic ligament injury, somebody's had pain for years, or they've got a complete tear, especially in the older attritional ruptures, I think you still have to do the reconstruction. I don't think the repair really has a, has a, has a, uh, a place. Or if you're a high-level pitcher. You know, I would typically today, in 2016, if somebody called and said, hey, you know, the, the, the Major League Baseball MVP towards UCL, what are you going to do? I would, I would do a reconstruction 100% of the time. I wouldn't do a repair because I don't have enough data yet. So is return quicker and safer with repair? That was the question that was asked of me today. And I think it's quicker, definitely. Safer, I'm not sure. There's not enough data. So I can't promote this for everyone, but it, it may work out for very specific cases. Thank you. Thanks, Lyle. It was a great talk. Um, Dr. Lee, question. Two great questions. So the first question in terms of orientation of the medial epicondyle tunnel, um, the reason we did the tunnel that direction is because when we first started doing these, we worried that they might fail. <laughs> and so we knew that if we made the orientation that direction, we could always drill right up the epicondyle and use that for revision case. It's probably uh, stronger if we go perpendicular like you're talking about in the epicondyle. And, and we may change that eventually, I think, as we get more um, confident in these, in these repairs. The second question about have, have we included a internal brace with a reconstruction. There have been a few cases of revision UCL where we felt like the native, the remaining graft was not bad, or um, there was one case that was a, a, actually another professional baseball player that was just sent to us uh, from, from the West Coast that, that had a torn reconstruction and they were going to do a revision reconstruction, and, but it was a complete tear off the sublime tubercle. So we repaired that reconstruction, the, the graft that was there initially, repaired it and put a brace on top. So I think there are multiple uses for it. I think it's a, it's a good uh, protective internal, internal protection, I guess you'd say, uh, for any kind of repair or reconstruction if you're worried about the tissue quality or the bone quality. Other questions? Yes. Just in, just in general with repairs or, or reconstruction for that matter, is there any conversation or, or research of incorporating like a PRP along with the surgeries to yeah, that's a great question. So the biologic side, you know, I think in, in everything we do in orthopedics, whether it's UCLs or labral repairs or rotator cuffs or even hand stuff, um, you know, I think we're, we're probably missing the boat in a lot of biologic opportunities. You know, we're counting on the body's natural healing mechanisms, which in a lot of these injuries is not very robust. And so you have, you know, things, the things where there's not a lot of bleeding, there's not a lot of uh, bone factors and, and bone marrow that come out with some of these procedures. You know, we have done some PRP, we've done some stem cells, some uh, iliac crest, bone marrow aspirate stem cells. Um, 
there's no science at all behind it right now. It's totally anecdotal. Um, I really believe that, you know, and this is a bold statement, but I, I think that if, if bone, marrow aspirate, bone marrow aspirate stem cells were free and free of morbidity and they didn't cost $1,000 for the spin kit to spin them down, I'd probably throw them in just about everything. <laughs> so I'm a believer because I've seen it in rotator cuff. I've seen it in some of the other things. Um, having said that, there's really no data. So I think, you know, doing PRP or stem cells or any of the biologics is just a leap of faith and it, it, you're trying to, you know, hopefully throw some more, some more material in to cause a healing response. I agree on the uh, PMAC, Lau. Question for you, Lau, the qu how fast will you return your reconstruction back earliest uh, time? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we have occasionally, we, just like an ACL or any other surgery, they're, they're those outliers. They're those people that, you know, week one look great, week six look great, week 12 look great. They're just, they're chomping at the bit to play. The earliest that I know we've ever sent somebody back, and I did it myself, was six months as a pitcher. Um, you know, I think biologically the graft is probably healed by four months, and that's why we let them start throwing. But there's a lot of process that still occurs, and there are a lot of people that have setbacks from four months to a year. So um, that's not universal, but as early as six months, I've had people go back with a reconstruction. So if you're putting the throwing program at four months, and they progress normally, um, and they look fine, six months you'd let them come back? That's right. Okay. That's, uh, I, I, that's my experience, um, and I think it's, um, I, the, the trend now is you get them back quicker, and I think that, that tissue is gonna heal quite well at, at six months, so it makes sense to me. Other questions? Go on. Do you ever run into, I guess, an interoperative decision aside from your algorithm and plan that you're gonna either repair or reconstruct, or you get in there and decide maybe this is more amenable to repair than you thought or vice versa? Yeah, that's another great question. So um, all of these patients that go in for repair are always consented for reconstruction because there are certainly cases where you think you can repair an endovulsion or a good ligament and you get in, you expose the ligament, it's just cheesy crap tissue. So um, we always have the reconstruction available. I don't know that I've had one where I went to do a reconstruction and did a repair instead, mainly because of the fact that, that I'm doing a reconstruction for other factors in those cases besides ligament morphology. So um, certainly for repair, you have to be prepared to do reconstruction, but I haven't gone the other way. Yeah. I've seen some guys, um, or I've seen just through the media with partial UCL tears where how they come to mind that it's pretty successfully for a period of time. And other guys with them to go right into surgery with a partial tear. So just curious the decision making process with regard to the elite pitcher yeah, I think that's certainly the art of what we do in medicine is that um, every player and every patient is different. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot of good data out there about what happens with partial tears and how many people can play. Um, the only study out there is Art Reddick's study from early 2000s, and, and they showed that 50% that of their players got back with conservative treatment of a UCL injury in an average of six to eight months. So very similar to a reconstruction or repair. Um, but, you know, the reality is a lot of players have partial tears. If you do an MRI on every Major League Baseball player, probably 80% have a partial UCL tear on MRI. So you have to go by the symptoms, the longevity of symptoms, uh, by where their pain is, and by their inability to throw. And that's why the conservative treatment is so important. There are certainly some players that because of where they are in their career, even if there's a chance that it may heal, it makes sense to go ahead and fix them because you're, you're, you're going from an odd of 40, 50% to an odd of 90% over a similar time frame. And so, you know, those decisions are really the art of the communication between, you know, me and the team and the person and their parents and their girlfriend and their wife. And, you know, trying to figure all that out is, is very difficult, but we don't operate on every partial UCL tear. You know, we do things like PRP and stem cells and, you know, all of these little anecdotal quirky things to try to make the player feel like we're trying to help the ligament heal. We do all those things when we're not sure that they need the surgery. Um, the reality is some people it's pretty obvious because of their situation. Uh, and so it's a very individualized treatment plan. Well, your approach to the uh, athlete who comes in, 60 year old player comes in, six to nine months of elbow pain, you've rehabbed him, his MRI is negative, he's got valgus extension overload symptoms, painful in the sublime tubercle. Um, you, in your heart you feel it's a UCL, MRI is negative, approach that. 
you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I had the opportunity to look up all these patients and call them and talk to them over the you know, 10 year period. And um, looking back at the MRIs on the patients, and this is gonna sound like malpractice, but the reality is when we do a UCL reconstruction, I would say 30% of the time the MRI is normal. Now that sounds crazy, but normal, meaning the ligament looks okay, it you know, doesn't look bad, but they have pain in the right spot. And so, you know, the, the patient Steve's talking about, 16 years old, has six to nine months of pain, obviously has pain at his, his ligament, sublime tubercle, right on that little knob that you can feel in your elbow. They have pain with valgus dressing, positive milking maneuver, all the signs that you know it's a ligament that hurts, but the ligament has kind of self-healed to the point where it looks okay on MRI. You know, in my mind, that still is a bad attenuated ligament and we can ride them out for another six to nine months, but more than likely, the only thing that's gonna fix them is a reconstruction. And so, you know, again, depending on the patient, if it's my son that's 16, I'd probably tell him to quit playing baseball because he's not gonna make any money doing it. <laughs> he doesn't have that kind of talent level. I'd say, go play a position, don't pitch anymore. But if he's your son and you think he's the best 16 year old player in the country, and he's gonna be a major league baseball player in five years, I'd go ahead and reconstruct him because I think that's the only way you get rid of the pain. I'm happy to hear you say that because I think it happens more commonly than we think and we get trapped into the, the MRI all the time so there's nothing wrong with it. So you see those patients coming up to seeing two or three different doctors and you tell them and they point out my MRI is negative. You right. say, so, well, you don't really care about the MRI. Um, anyone else? No, really great talk, very informative. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming here today. Thank you. Thank you.